السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and his entire household, all his companions, may Allah bless them and bless every single one of us and grant us goodness. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, yesterday we were making mention of the story where there was an accusation leveled against the most pure of women, Aisha radiallahu anha. And just to recap as to exactly what had happened as they were returning from the battle of Banu al-Mustaliq, the Prophet وسلم, decided to instruct the army to leave. And Aisha radiallahu anha was looking for a bracelet of hers or a necklace. And at that time, they used to have a hawdaj. In the Arabic language, the hawdaj is the cover at the top of the animal or at the top of the camel, where the women folk used to sit as the camel used to move. It used to protect them from the sun as well as act as privacy for them. And when they stopped at a specific place, the camel would be made to sit down. The men would lift up the entire haudaj and put it to the side, which would make it look like a little tent. And thereafter, they would go away and the women would then either come out or remain in there and so on, be protected from the sun and what have you. So Aisha radiallahu anha says, and the, as they had put it down, and I was doing some of my things, whatever I had to do, I realized that I was missing a necklace and I went hunting for it, looking for it around. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed the army to leave. They lifted up this hawdaj thinking that Aisha radiallahu anha was inside. They placed it on the camel and they progressed. And she says, when I got back to the place where, where they were, I noticed there was no one. Everyone had gone. And I told myself that perhaps they will notice my absence and they will return. But sadly, they did not return. The army continued. And this was after the battle of Banu al-Mustaliq. After some time, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum was passing from the path. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was dressed in black. I was quite tired. I was sitting down on the, on the floor, meaning on the desert sand. And I had fallen off to sleep. And I, I got up by... Someone saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. As I looked, it was Safwan ibn al Mu'attal radiallahu an. He did not utter one word. He had understood already that this is Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, and she has been left behind by the entire caravan as they left. So he allowed his camel to be seated and he got her onto it and he took her all the way to Al Madinah Al Munawwara. As they arrived, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, who was the head of the hypocrites, who had during the battle of Banu al-Mustalik made mention of something very strange. He said, La irra ja'na ila al-madinati la yukhrijanna al-a'azzu minha al-adhal. When we get to Madinah Munawwara, the superior will kick out the inferior. Meaning, we are going to fix Muhammad, a'udhu billah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we will see how we will remove him out. And we made mention yesterday of Usaid ibn Hudayr and the other companions who said, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are the superior and he is the inferior. So this man had had a plan in his head. Whatever the plan was, this gave him reason to make something else up as well. And so when he saw Aisha radiallahu anha enter Medina Munawwara with Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal, he immediately started spreading a rumor that these two have committed the sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. May he grant us goodness, may he protect us and our offspring, and may he really protect our tongues as well. So this rumor began, and Aisha radiallahu anha did not know about it at all. She didn't even hear. She went home and it continued in the sense that outside the house people started talking and the people were divided into three categories, three major categories. One of them, those who invented the lie. The head was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. They created it. They knew it was just a rumor which they had started with evil intent. The second group, those like Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, he told his wife, Ummu Ayyub, he says, Oh, Ummu Ayyub, 
Could you ever do something like that? She said, never. Well, if you cannot, Aisha is cleaner than you. Allahu Akbar. So it's definitely a lie. And we are clean. We would believe she is even cleaner than us. So they immediately threw out the statement and they refused to utter it. And they said, we believe that if we are pure, she is even purer. Radiallahu anhum jami'an. That was one category of people. The other category of people were those who had spread the lie. They did not create it, but they spread it. They spoke about it. Did you hear the latest gossip? And so on. Now this is typical in our scenario nowadays. What happens to us? We find, for some reason, we find sweetness in words and in statements where rumor is being spread about others. May Allah safeguard us. So this is why we have a lesson to learn from this. And inshallah, we will get to it in a few moments. So the Prophet ﷺ heard about it and he was very upset. He went into Aisha radiallahu anha's room several times and he would just ask her, Kaifatikum, which means, how is that one? He's talking to her instead of saying, how are you? He's saying, how is that one? Referring to her in absence, showing a distance between him and her. How is that one? Imagine you're talking to your wife and you're saying, how is that one? <laughs> how, how are you? Allahu Akbar. So this was him. He was upset, but this is how he showed it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And at the same time, he knew that it could either be a lie or it could be true. Although he knew within his heart that this is a lie. But for him to come out and say, this is a lie. People would think you're defending your wife. May Allah protect us. So he had to wait for revelation for it to come with clarification to clear the name of Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha. But revelation did not come. Do you know why? One of the reasons was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept this whole incident as a test in order to test everyone and in order for it to be a lesson for us who came later on generations down the line. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So she was very, very innocent of it. She didn't even know why is the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam being so distant until one day she went out with one of her relatives known as Ummu Mistah, the mother of Mistah ibn Athatha. And when she went out, this woman tells her, Ta'isa Mistah, Mistah has definitely lost, you know, destruction upon Mistah. So Aisha radiallahu anha looks at her and says, how can you say that about someone who took part in the battle of Badr? Mistah ibn Athatha radiallahu anha. He was a poor man who was related to Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Aisha was the daughter of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr used to spend money on him. And Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu used to give him charities and look after him. So Aisha is saying, Oh, Ummu Mistah, how can you say this about your own son when he has taken part in the battle of Badr? And we made mention of the rank of the people who took part in the battle of Badr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us also a rank through his mercy. So she said, didn't you hear what he is saying? Now, Mistah was not from amongst those who invented the lie, but he was one of those who was active in spreading it. Did you hear what happened? And then he would tell someone. Did you hear what happened? And then tell someone. Did you hear what happened? And then tell someone. So now when his mother told Aisha radiallahu anha, she was shocked. She went back home in tears. The Prophet ﷺ walked in, same question, Kaifatikum, how is that one? She says, O oh Messenger, وسلم, do you permit me to go to my parents' home? Look at this word. Do you allow me to go home? Now she's understood what's happening. Do you allow me to go and see my mother and father? So the Prophet ﷺ permitted her to go. She went in order to find out what to be done. Oh my mother, have you heard what people are saying? She said, Ummu Ruman radiyallahu anha, the mother of Aisha radiyallahu anha. Do you know when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on spoke about Ummu Ruman, the mother of Aisha, he said, whoever wants to see a hur from Jannah, look at Ummu Ruman, subhanallah. This was the mother of Aisha radiyallahu anha. So she speaks to her daughter saying, oh my daughter, don't worry, don't get too overexcited about this rumor here, meaning don't overreact. Leave it. Sometimes what happens, someone who is good looking like you, quite young like you, subhanallah, you may have people who, who spread things and so on. Don't read too deep into it, ya Aisha. So the mother is giving advice to her daughter, subhanallah. 
And Aisha radiallahu anha says, no, it's very difficult for me because here there is rumor spread. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not speaking to me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent revelation and I am completely innocent. The mother did not doubt the innocence of her daughter. Subhanallah. And the father, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, what should he say? He is a friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well as a father-in-law at the same time. And he is a person who is a follower at the same time. What should he say? Allah and his messenger know best. So this caused a lot of discomfort until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam many days later after continuing in this manner with Aisha radiallahu anha crying, rumors spreading, people are falling into several categories and so on. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, I couldn't even sleep properly and I couldn't even eat and I couldn't I really didn't even understand what was happening due to lots of crying and so on. But all I knew is Allah would clear my name. Allah would send revelation. I was innocent, completely innocent. So now the Prophet ﷺ decided to ask some of his companions because revelation did not come for more than a month. So he calls Ali ibn Abi Talib and Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhuma. He says, oh Ali, what do you think? Oh Usama, what do you think? Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, he says, this is a fabrication. That's what he says. He says, Aisha radiallahu anha, Ummul Mu'mineen, she is clean, she is pure. This is all the mischief of hypocrites and so on. And Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, look, she is a young lady. There are many other women besides her. Why don't you ask the servant Barira and see what she says? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks Barira. Barira was the servant of Aisha radiallahu anha. Oh Barira, what do you think of this? Barira says, Wallahi, it is false. She is one of the most chaste women that you could have. Very clean, very pure. And she went on praising her in her own words. And Rasulullah then got up. He was upset. He went out where the Ansar were. And he says, Man ya'dhuruni fi rajulin qad balagha adahu fi ahli bayti. Who is going to excuse me? Who is going to excuse me regarding a person whose harm has now reached the innermost part of my own home? Which means Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Which means who can retaliate or who would excuse me if I were to retaliate? Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu gets up and says, Oh messenger, who is he? If he is from my clan, I will execute him. And if he is from the other clan, you tell us what to do, we will do it. So immediately, Sa'd ibn Ubadah, who was from the other clan, one was Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, who made the statement. Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu said, No, you won't kill him. If he is from our clan, you won't kill him. How can you say that you will sort him out and so on? And it pursued. Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu anhu got up and he also added something. He said, no, if this person has harmed the messenger, then they deserve to be dealt with. How dare someone say something of this nature? And the Prophet sallallahu was standing and watching the Ansar talking amongst themselves with the Muhajireen and so on. And there was this discussion. And they, in Medina Munawwara, people were all just into all these categories. One group talking, one group excited in the background, really watching in glee as everything is happening according to their plan. Those were the hypocrites. And one group saying this is a total fabrication. So then the Prophet wasallam goes into the room of Aisha radiallahu anha and he greets. Now when he greets, she thought some goodness is coming. But instead of that, he says a tashahud, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Then he says, amma ba'du, thereafter. So now he is making a statement. It's a statement regarding what happened. He's saying, oh Aisha, if you are innocent, Allah will reveal your innocence. And if you have committed a sin, remember, you admit your error to Allah, Allah will forgive you and Allah will cleanse you and so on. So he gave her the options and she began to weep because this meant that there is still no clarification. She began to weep until there came a time when she said, if I am to say I am innocent, they won't believe me. And if I am to say that I am guilty, that's what they want to hear. But that would be a lie because I am innocent. So I'm in a fix basically, caught between the two. Aisha radiallahu anha is saying, and she says, I told them 
that I cannot utter any words besides the words of the Prophet Yaqub, Jacob, may peace be upon him. When he had lost his son Yusuf alayhi salam, he said, My patience shall be beautiful by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah is the one who will assist regarding their statements and what they are describing. This was the statement. She repeated this. And then she says, as they walked out of the house before they could leave the house, Revelation came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was almost a month, over a month later. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, those who have come with the fabrication are a group from amongst you. Imagine when revelation came out, the word fabrication was used. As soon as that word was used, it was a clarification for everything. Because that what they, that's what they were waiting for. The minute the term if was used, it means a fabrication. Someone who has accused another person falsely of immorality. So when Allah revealed the verses that the, the, those who have brought about this false accusation are a group from amongst you, they knew it was already a lie. Subhanallah. Then Allah says, do not think that it is bad for you. It is in fact good for you. Let's stop there for a moment. Today when people spread rumor about us, do you know that sometimes your success is directly connected to the rumor that people spread about you? As a, a direct result of it, Allah gives you success in different aspects of your life. Because when they spread rumor, they are taking away your sin. When they've taken away your sins, sometimes things you haven't even done because the rumor continues and spreads amongst a thousand people when you are only one man or one woman. So a thousand people have taken away more than the sins you actually have by then giving you the good deeds they have. What happens to you? You become pure, you become cleansed, you become a person who's elevated, your doors open one after the other. You don't know how come I am leading such a happy life, but it is all connected to the rumor that is spread against you. Allah says, don't ever think it's bad for you. It's actually very good for you. Subhanallah. And then Allah says, everyone who took part in that particular accusation shall bear their sin of it. And the one who created the fabrication shall have a massive punishment who was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses. And Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was told by Umm Ruman, her mother, get up. Why don't you embrace him? Because now the problem is sorted. She says, why should I get up and embrace him? I have none to thank besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was obviously upset at the time because she was being accused. And now she was so happy because the cleansing came from the heavens subhanallah. And this is why she always used to say to her compatriots that, you know, I am the one whose name was cleansed from the heavens subhanallah. And these were the verses, Surah An-Nur. If we pick up the Quran and read Surah An-Nur, we will see these verses there. Beautiful, powerful verses. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this. It is a very, very interesting story. But the lessons to be learned from there are even greater. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينٌ Shouldn't the, the believers when they heard such a rumor thought, think to themselves, shouldn't they have thought to themselves that if we cannot do this, she definitely cannot do it. And this is what Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu had done. And they should have said, this is a fabrication and it's a lie. وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَن نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ 
shouldn't you have uttered immediately as you heard it that look we should not be messing our tongues with this type of statement don't talk about this indeed it's a big fabrication against the pure people subhanallah so this is allah teaching us when you hear rumor when you hear various comments the best thing is to say i don't want to mess my tongue with this statement and i don't want to utter that which is lies may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us then allah says لولا جاءوا عليه بأربعة شهداء. Let them bring forth four eyewitnesses regarding the act. If they don't bring those four eyewitnesses, فأولئك عند الله هم الكاذبون. Then they are the liars in the eyes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. In fact, at that point. A punishment was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who were spreading the accusation. Allah says they had to be whipped 80 lashes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Anyone who accuses a believing male or female of immorality and adultery, they should be told to bring four eyewitnesses who have witnessed the act. If they cannot do that, they should be lashed 80 lashes. And this is the injunction of the Quran. Today we see people walking out there and we very, very interestingly say, hey, you know what? These people are having an affair or these people are going out. Wallahi, you know what Allah says? If you have received it with your tongues, you have uttered it with your tongues, you are saying the statement with your mouths, and you are considering it light, yet in the eyes of Allah, it is a huge sin to accuse people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Really. Look at the words. Then Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةُ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ Those people who love to spread the tales of immorality amongst the believers, for them there will be a severe punishment in this world and then in the next as well. What does this mean? People who like to spread stories, true or false, if it is a story of immorality, why spread it? You are encouraging others. The first thing you're doing is you're backbiting. If it's not backbiting, it is slander. And on top of that, you will be telling others and people will start thinking, well, this is a sin that is common. So if we are committing it, then it doesn't make us any different from anybody else and so on. So it encourages people to actually sin. Allah says that is why. Stories of immorality, you should never ever spread them. Those who like to spread stories of immorality amongst the believing male and female, they will be punished, Allah says, in this world and then the next. May Allah safeguard us. And from this, the ulama say that to read books that, ha that are what we would term X-rated, full of stories of immorality is forbidden because it falls under this verse. And the same applies pornography and so on and anything immoral even if there is a movie that has something immoral in it we should remember we should be further away from it may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us the reason why i say further away is we as muslimin shouldn't even be indulged in that in the first place may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us a lesson there are so many verses here that have a lesson for all of us now aisha radiallahu anha her name was cleansed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala her status was elevated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was faced with a difficulty. What was the difficulty? That young man, Mistah ibn Athatha, who was spreading the rumor, he was one of the relatives and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, as we said, used to spend on him and give him charities and look after him basically. So when he spread the rumor, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was so upset that he said, Wallahi, I'm not going to spend on this man again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses after this to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq or referring to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. These verses revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا يَأْتَلِ أُلُوا الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُلِي الْقُرْبَىٰ 
والمساكين والمهاجرين في سبيل الله وليعفوا وليصفحوا ألا تحبون أن يغفر الله لكم والله غفور رحيم Those who have been granted virtue by Allah and ease and wealth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they should never take an oath or make an oath that they are not going to spend upon the poor and upon people who have engaged in the hijrah and upon those who are relatives they should not do that they should forgive and they should embrace for indeed do they not want to be forgiven by allah the question is do you not want to be forgiven by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala well allah is most forgiving most merciful when abu bakr as-siddiq radiallahu anhu heard this verse he immediately said yes indeed i want to be forgiven by allah so i forgive this man what about the oath you had taken an oath well he had to pay the recompense of that oath in order to then break it so that he could fulfill the command of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never again did he stop in his charitable deeds towards this particular man may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us today we would never help someone who has actively spread rumor about us and harmed us in our lives or our family members. I don't think from amongst us, there would be many, if any, who would actually do that. And on top of that, even if we were to help, sometimes shaitan comes to us and makes us think, right, because I am financing this man, I can now control him. It doesn't suddenly enslave the person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those whom, when we spend, we spend for his cause. And may he make us from those who learn a lesson from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Do you know why he forgave? One of the reasons obviously was the instruction of Allah. But he says, I want to be forgiven by Allah. So let me forgive this man. If we forgive people, Allah will forgive us. Have mercy upon those on earth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy upon you. So if we have a quality of forgiving people, you will find that Allah's quality of forgiveness is far greater than anything we can come up with. And this is why find it in your heart to forgive. For indeed, when Allah sees that on the day that we need forgiveness, we will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiving us. Now, this is a very, very powerful verse. And these entire verses that we have read today, very powerful. The lessons are all in Surah An-Nur. If we turn the pages of Surah An-Nur, we will come to learn whatever we have said this evening. And Alhamdulillah, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant us purity and to grant us chastity to protect us and our offspring, our family members and the Ummah at large from immoral, immoral behavior. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala purify us all. Now we have Another battle that took place at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is reported in the fifth year of Hijrah. And when in the fifth year, the majority say in the month of Shawwal, which was just after Ramadan. You see, yesterday we made mention of Banu Nadir, the tribe and the group of people who were told to leave al Madinatul Munawwara. And these people, a lot of them went to a place near Sham, known as Adri'at. But there were some of them, a group of them who had gone to Khaybar. From amongst them was Huyay ibn al-Akhtab and a few others. These were the senior people from those who were expelled from Banu al-Nadir. That was a Jewish clan in the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. They had gone to Khaybar. From Khaybar, they decided, we are wealthy. We have a lot of date palms, a lot of dates and so on, a lot of produce. Why don't we form a little committee? And we let this committee go and visit all the tribes and clans, mainly the two major groups. One was Ghatafan and one was Quraysh. We will go to Ghatafan and speak to them and we will go to Quraysh and speak to them and we will bring them together and we will be allied together. And as a confederate, we will then march on to Medina Munawwara and wipe out the Muslims for once and for all because they chased us out of al Madinah Munawwara. Now to refresh your memories, the reason why they were expelled was they broke the treaty. They wanted to murder Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were caught red handed. And on top of that, they had broken the treaty in several other ways. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked them to leave. And that was actually some point of mercy because they were guilty of war crimes. They could have been executed rightfully, but they were not. They were asked to leave. 
So these people, they sent a team to Ghatafan. They told Ghatafan, look, we want you to give us as many men as you can. We're going to come together and make an alliance and we will pay you for it. Because Ghatafan, they had no problem. They had no problem at all. They did not want to fight. Quraysh was the one who wanted to fight. So these people said, okay, we will pay you. Ghatafan says, how much are you going to pay us? So the, the people of Khaybar, these people of Banu Nadir, they said, we will pay you one year's produce of dates from the whole of Khaybar. Now that's a lot. It's like saying the economy of our whole country for one year will go to you. May Allah protect us. So these people agreed. No problem, we join your alliance. In the meantime, the same group went to Quraysh and they spoke to Abu Sufyan. Look, we have the alliance. It's already made up of little tribes and groups and Ghatafan has joined us with thousands of men. You also bring men and so on. And Quraysh, they had a gripe against the Muslims. They wanted to settle scores. So they said, this is a brilliant idea. And in no time they agreed. They decided we are going to join. And thereafter they said, Let's march on to Medina Munawwara. They gathered 10,000 men. Now in the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ knew everything that was going on. He was aware of what the people of Banu Nadir were doing. He was aware of the agreement with Ghatafan. He was aware of the agreement with Quraysh. And he was also aware that now they want to march on to al Madinatul Munawwara. So the Prophet ﷺ got together his companions. And he says, oh my companions. What should we do? 10,000 strong men, heavily armed from different tribes and groups and alliance, Al-Ahzab, they are coming towards Medina Munawwara. What should we do? So the different companions began to make suggestions until Salman Al-Farisi, the man from Persia, radiallahu anhu, the man whom we spoke about how he accepted Islam and he, his father was one of the fire worshippers in Persia and he had then left and gone to Asham where he became a Christian and from there he was enslaved on his way to Arabia in pursuit of the messenger and when he came to Medina Munawwara how he accepted Islam and how the Prophet ﷺ assisted him to pay those who had enslaved him in order for him to buy his freedom by planting those date palms and we said from 300 of them none of those date palms had actually died this is the same man he says oh messenger in my area, which means in Persia, when there is a big army that is coming and we want to block the horses from entering, we create, we dig a trench around the city. We dig a trench around the city. Now for us to think of a trench around the whole of Medina, that is something very difficult. But for your information, there was no need to dig the trench around the whole of Medina because there were only certain places from which the army could have entered Medina. On some parts it was very rocky. Some parts it was mountainous. They couldn't enter from those parts. Only the flat land where they could have come from, that is where the trench was then agreed to be dug. But the Prophet ﷺ asked his companions, what do you all think of this? Some new strategy of war. Nobody had known about it before. The people here, no one was aware that this was going to happen. So the Prophet ﷺ, after having consulted his companions, agreed and they went out on horseback to look where should this thing be dug. They demarcated it correctly and every 40 feet was given to 10 companions to dig. And the Prophet ﷺ himself joined in also in one of the groups. ﷺ. Not like the leaders of today, they sit back and the army is busy working. Here the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so much so that was a time of hunger. It was a time when they had a few days to achieve this whole huge achievement, to dig this big trench. They just had a few days. It is reported that in total, this trench was 10 kilometers long in the different parts of it. 22 feet wide, 16 feet deep, took six days to dig. And each 10 companions were handed 40 feet to dig. Subhanallah. Imagine this is quite deep. It's not a joke. And it's quite wide as well. Because a horse, as the horses are coming, they don't go so deep. They would refuse to get in. And what would happen is, it would give the Muslims an opportunity to be with all their, their arrows and spears and weaponry on the, on the sides. 
such that if anyone attempted to come, they would be pelted or they would be immediately uh, attacked with arrows and so on. So this was something in no time, subhanallah, this was done. We said it took them six days. These six days were six days of great difficulty where they were working flat out, subhanallah, because they had to do it urgently. And in these six days, it's important for me to, ma to make mention of some of the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was digging himself. And when they had a huge rock to break and they couldn't break it, they called him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to some narrations, he was given the power of 30 men, subhanallah. He was given the power of 30 men, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would then destroy the rock and flatten it out or make it rubble. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet the companions were unable to do that. So Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu says when he lifted a rock in order to hit it on another one, I saw that he had tied a rock on his belly because of hunger. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a person is hungry. Try it out. It actually works. You know, I was speaking to someone from Europe complaining about how long the fast is. I said, have you ever tried the sunnah? You know, tie a rock. They started laughing. I said, you know what? If you can't tie a hot water bottle or a cold water bottle, it might work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. What it does, it actually flattens the belly and pushes it in so that you don't feel hungry, although you are very hungry. Subhanallah. So the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Jabir ibn Abdullah saw this, he felt that this is the messenger. He is working so hard. He saw all this dust on the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa body and he saw a rock tied on his belly and he then went home. He tells his wife, home was very close, not very far from the trench. He says, what do we have? She says, well, we have a goat and we have a little bit of barley so, or wheat. And he says, okay, let me slaughter this thing and prepare a good meal, put this thing in the oven and I'm calling Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa with one or two men. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa then was told by Jabir ibn Abdullah that Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you can come to my home, I've prepared a small meal, you and perhaps you can bring one or two people. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him what he said, he repeated it. When he said that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made an announcement, loud announcement. He says, we have been invited to the house of Jabir ibn Abdullah, let's all go for a meal. Now he was shocked, how are we going to go? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I only had told him to bring along one or two people because how are we going to feed the whole army here? And a lot of the companions had come and Jabir ibn Abdullah tells his wife that you know what, they are coming and there's a lot of them. Now think what would happen in our case. I think we would be dead meat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us in some cases. And in some cases they would be very happy, mashallah, to say no problem. I know of some cases where they say you can bring as many as you want but muchachos is around the corner you better bring some food there as well mashallah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and barakah wallahi we have so much convenience allah has made life so easy for us still sometimes we are not hospitable mashallah i know this community full of hospitality sometimes you find shaitan overtakes us and we feel lazy when the barakah is in feeding the guest Sometimes the barakah is in feeding the guest. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to get worried when no guest used to come to their homes. They used to think, what's going on? Is there something wrong with my wealth? Is there something wrong with my sustenance? No barakah in the home. So what happened here? When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was coming with all his companions, Jabir radiallahu anhu tells his wife, and now there are a few narrations I'm mentioning one of them. In one narration, the wife says, does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam know that we had only told him one or two people and he says yes well in that case no problem in that case it's fine subhanallah when the prophet sallallahu was coming he sent an instruction go and tell your family that they should not take the pot off the fire and they should not remove whatever is in the oven from it subhanallah they were about to witness a miracle the prophet sallallahu came he removed from the pot and he kept on removing from the pot and he kept on removing from the pot and he kept on removing from the oven until the whole army was fed. Subhanallah. This was the miracle. A similar miracle had happened to the Prophet Isa alayhi salatu was salam aforetime. Jesus may peace be upon him. We have made mention of this in the past. 
And it is made mention of even in the ahadith and the records of the Muslimin that this is from amongst the miracles of the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Here it has repeated itself with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. They were shocked. They were not only shocked, but it resulted in them being reinforced, their iman being strengthened. They went back to dig. And subhanallah, in no time this army had arrived. When the army came, they were also surprised. They had heard that the Muslims are doing something strange. Because there was one more tribe of these people of the book in, on the outskirts of Medina, known as Banu Quraidah. We heard that Banu Qainuqa was expelled. Banu Nadir were expelled. And as for Banu Quraidah, they were there, but they felt this time there is no way the Muslims are going to win. They're going to be wiped out. So they aligned themselves with the Confederates. They even sent or they were trying to send some camels with some dates and some food and assistance, which was intercepted by the Muslims and it was taken away. And the Prophet ﷺ then made it clear that these people have broken the treaty as well. Banu Quraidah. And Banu Quraidah, they had a plan. They had hatched a plan. Inshallah, we will see it in a few moments. So the armies came. They were shocked. They looked at this trench. They couldn't move. As they tried, they were being attacked by spears, the Muslims. So they couldn't move. They were camping outside. If they went around, the Prophet ﷺ had spread his army out. All the Muslims were there because they were in Medina. So there was no question of how many men were the Muslims. They were all there. And so there were some on the mountains taking care of that, some on the rocky land taking care of that, some on the different parts of Medina taking care of that. And the, the strategic trench which was dug, subhanallah, was heavily protected by the Muslims, which means nobody can come in. Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl tried to come in, he was immediately attacked. In fact, there was another man who tried to come in as well, and he was also attacked. But before we get to that, in the meantime in Medina Munawwara, Something happened. Banu Quraidah decided, you know what? We need to see how best we can attack the Muslims from behind. So let us first go and try and cause disturbance amongst their women and children who are left in the city. So as they sent a spy, Safiya binti Abdul Muttalib, who was the aunt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the sister of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, she saw the spy come in to spy on the women and children in Medina. So she took a log and she knocked him, executing the man. He was executed. Gone. Why? Espionage. The man was a spy. The man was guilty of a crime, a huge crime. And at the same time, he was coming to go back to Banu Quraidah to tell them that you can come and perhaps attack the women or anything could have happened. So when they saw that this man has been attacked by a log from behind a home, they thought that now there are many men who are also hidden within Medina Munawwara. So they did not bother going to attack there. Subhanallah, look at the wisdom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired this Sahabiya to actually knock this man in a way that the whole army had stayed behind and they were protected. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us as well. As we said, Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl tried to come through the uh, trench. They attacked him. He had to go back. Then there was a man known as Amr ibn Abdiwid. This man, Amr ibn Abdiwid, he tried to come into the trench in order to get to the Muslim side and Ali radiallahu anhu attacked him and he died on the Muslim side, which means he had come almost to where the Muslims were. He, when he died, Quraysh offered money to say, we will pay you whatever you want to retrieve this body. We want the body of the dead man. The Prophet ﷺ got up and said, this is a body, it is a dirty body, it is a filthy body, the body of a mushrik, we will never accept any money for it, throw it, meaning give it back to them. Give it back to them as is, we don't want money for it. Because it would be selling a dead body, and that would be haram in the sharia. You are selling a dead body, why do you want to do that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness, that body was returned thereafter. And now, as these people were camping and they were trying and looking and thinking several things happened first the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam decided that we need to send someone into that camp to see exactly what is going on and what is happening 
So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose a man from Ghatafan who had accepted Islam. And this man who had accepted Islam from Ghatafan, his name was Nu'aym ibn Mas'ud al-Ghatafani. No one from Ghatafan knew that this man had accepted Islam. So he says, O Messenger, I can go and I can do anything because they don't even know. So the Prophet ﷺ instructed him to go and told him what to do. This man was extremely intelligent, very intelligent. He went out and he arrived on the other side and he spoke to Ghatafan and he spoke to the Jewish tribe of Banu Nadir and those who had come from Khaybar and he spoke to the people of Quraysh telling each one a different story. So he told these people of Quraysh that you see these Jewish people are asking you for a guarantee because now they're getting tired. They're getting fed up. They're not trusting you anymore. Then he tells the people of Ghatafan, you people are my people. We are going to be fought for no reason. What are we going to go back with? And then he tells the people of Khaybar or those the Huyay ibn Akhtab and the others, he tells them, you see, Quraysh is mistrusting you. They are planning to leave. They want to go away. So each one began to doubt the other. So what happened? The alliance, there was now visible cracks that were there. And this type of dissent began amongst the alliance. In the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ called some of the leaders of Ghatafan onto this side in order to silently strike a deal with them. He sent a messenger and he brought two of their leaders. And he told the two leaders, one was Uyayna ibn Hisan and the other one was Al-Harith ibn Awf. He says, do you know what? You people want to fight us. For what reason? The only thing you want is wealth. These people have promised you that they will give you the dates of Khaybar for one year. Well, what if we promise you one third of the dates of Medina or one third of the produce of Medina? Would you then go away? They said, yes, we'll go away. Because the only thing we want is money. If we're getting it without a fight, why should we fight? But we want more than one third. The Prophet says, no. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you get one third. If we agree, we sign an agreement that we will give you one third of the produce of Medina for the year on condition that you leave this confederation and you return and you do not fight the Muslims and so on and so forth. So the people of Ghatafan agreed and they said, okay, we're going to go. In the meantime, the Prophet ﷺ had a habit. He always consulted his companions. So he looked at Sa'd ibn Mu'ad radiallahu an, the head of al aws He says, oh Sa'd, what's your opinion? Sa'ad says, why should we pay them our produce? For what? Let them go back. Allah will give us victory. Why should we promise these people one third of our produce? We, as it is, we are going to win. This war is going to be won by us. And it's impossible for us not to win this by the will of Allah and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we should strike an agreement. So these two people were shocked because he wasn't the only one who said that. The other companions agreed with him. They said, we do not want, we do not want to strike an agreement with Ghatafan. Send them back. They asked, O oh, Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is this revelation or can we say something? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, no, you can say whatever you want because we are still trying to agree with these people. They refused flat. So the people of Ghatafan had to go back. When they went back, there was even a bigger disaster. Because now there were cracks amongst the people of Ghatafan. They were getting tired. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his help after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made a lot of dua. And after so many days, subhanallah, so many days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu dhkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. إِذْ جَاءَتْكُمْ جُنُودٌ فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا وَجُنُودًا لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا O you who believe, remember the favor of Allah upon you. The day that the alliance and the confederates had come to you and we sent to them a very strong cold wind and armies that you did not see. The angels had also come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this favor upon the believers. So the weather conditions began to change miraculously. Why do we say miraculously? There was only a trench between the Muslimin and the Kuffar. 
And on that side, it was cold wind and then it started to rain and there was quite a lot of chaos. And on this side, there was absolutely nothing. Subhanallah. This was another miracle, mu'jizah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the miracles of Nubuwa. Allah had granted to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Muslims were camped in different places. If we visit today, one of the places by Jabal Sila in Medina Munawwara, the Mount of Sila, where part of the trench was dug. There is a massive masjid there and they will show you this is the place where Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu had camped. This is the place where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had camped. And this is the place where, for example, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu had camped and so on. It is still there and we can go and actually see where this thing happened. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had made a lot of dua and part of his dua, it's important to say the words he said. He says, O oh Allah, who revealed this book, and O oh Allah, who has full control of the clouds, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who will destroy these confederates, split them up and destroy them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after some time, sent this rain, and this rain came in, and not only the rain, but severe wind. What did the wind do? cold wind the fires were extinguished the tents were flying the horses became hysterical and the people were becoming very ill and sick and they decided no we need to leave so a, a group started leaving another group started leaving and these people started leaving subhanallah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this gift that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it's important we make mention of one other person who took or who played a very important role in this battle. His name was Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, who can go and spy for us on the other side? Be careful. And a little while later, when he saw that no one is responding, he says, oh Hudayfa, get up and go for us on the other side. Be careful, bring us news of the people. So Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman in the evening when it was very dark, and the wind was blowing and so on. It had already started blowing. He went on to the other side. And as he was sitting, he was listening to everything. And he says, Wallahi, I was so close to Abu Sufyan. Had, if I wanted, I could have taken my spear and executed him there. Abu Sufyan was the leader of the enemy. And he says, but I did not do that. Because the Prophet Sallallahu says, be careful and don't let them find out about you. Meaning don't give yourself up. And he says, then in the evening, Abu Sufyan sensed something. So he says, oh, my people, I fear there is a spy amongst us. So each one of you grab hold of the person next to you and ask him his name. Allahu Akbar. So as soon as Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman heard this, he immediately picked the, ne the person next to him and said, what's your name? He says, I'm Muawiyah. And he picked the one next to him and says, what's your name? He says, I'm Amr ibn al-As. And he was quiet. No one asked him, who are you? Because <laughs> he had asked both of them. Subhanallah. And when he came back, he told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what had happened. And this was also a miracle where he was very intelligent. He immediately asked, what's your name? And what's your name? And so nobody asked him what was his name. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. These people thereafter were dispersed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verses were revealed in the whole surah known as Surah Al-Ahzab, where Allah makes mention of the hypocrites and how they had wanted to go back. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of how there were people who really felt that on this day the Muslims would not be victorious. But Allah says with, with our power, we chased them away. We sent them. They went back to Makkah al Mukarramah and they had lost. And inshallah, tomorrow we will go through some of these verses that expose the hypocrites. And at the same time, we will see what happened to Banu Quraida, those people who had sided with the enemy, thinking that on that day the Muslims would never win and they broke their treaty. What did the Prophet وسلم, do to them? Inshallah, we will see that tomorrow. Until then, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.